Hi, I'm Brandon Sanderson. I am going to be listening to clips of my audiobooks, some of which I've heard before, some I've never heard before. And I am going to be responding to them and telling you some of the stories behind the scenes that made these specific scenes in these books come to pass. The Admiral sipped her coffee, still not looking toward me. I stared at her back, her silvery hair, bracing myself for the words, you're out. Don't you think it's time to stop this farce, she said, turning a page. Drop out now. I'll let you keep your cadet's pin. I frowned. Why ask? Why not just say the words? She had the power now that I'd broken her rules, didn't she? Ironsides turned her chair, fixing me with a cold stare. Nothing to say, cadet? All right. So this is actually the first time I've heard that scene in the UK edition. Um, and man, I, I'm American, so UK accents just sound so posh to me. Uh, it, it is so much fun to hear and be like, "Ooh, I, I, my prose sounds so elevated. Um, <laughs> the big theme that I wanted to deal with in the book was courage. Um, what is courage? What does it mean to be courageous? Um, are there times where walking away is more courageous than staying the, the course? Uh, we celebrate courage. Do we even understand courage? And so what's happening in this scene is I'm starting to dig into this, right? Um, the Admiral has a certain perspective on courage and Spence's father did not match that perspective. And in the Admiral's um, eyes, Spence um, is tainted by her father's legacy. Um, is courage something that's hereditary? That's a question that I, I wanted to ask, and I'm not going to answer it here. I answer it in the book, but that is kind of the, the context of the scene and uh, where the themes came from originally. The sounds from behind us grew even louder. I charged forward and met up with Chet, who had paused to wait for me. He took off again as soon as I reached him. Something's wrong, he said quietly. The Grig shouldn't be following. This is bad, Spencer Nightshade. Very bad. A loud snap sounded behind us. It was closer now. Too close. Terrifyingly close. Don't look, my warrior heritage whispered to me. I looked anyway. So that's interesting because Chet, who's a character in the third book, is British in my head. And ha speaks with a British accent every time I was writing him. That's uh, that's where I was going with him. So that's kind of uh, interesting. Um, so Cytonic is um, a solo adventure. I wanted to really dig in to Spence's character in this third book. And so uh, she is separated from her support structure in a very strict way, a very deliberate and difficult to overcome way, shall we say. This scene is kind of to encapsulate that. It's near the beginning of the book, and the whole goal of this scene is to say, all right, Spencer, now you're going to have to deal with this. As an author, I'm kind of sorry, but I'm not really sorry, because there's a whole lot for, for you to learn in this book. And this is our, this is our warning shot to say, hey, uh, this, uh, this book's going to be a little different. He didn't play a specific tune on the Anthea, just plucks here and there, an occasional scale or fifth, like chit-chat in string form. Aesthetic genius, Witt said. Invention, acumen, creativity. Noble ideals indeed. Most men would pick one of those if given the choice and name them the greatest of talents. He plucked a string. What beautiful liars we are. Okay, so uh, this is from the the Wit monologue at the end of The Way of Kings. So there's a character uh, named Wit, and uh, he is this, uh, this fun incarnation of a jester. I have loved, since I was young, this archetype of storyteller, the, the, the storyteller within a story. Um, one of my favorite Shakespeare's is Twelfth Nights, who has kind of this thing. My other, one of my other favorite Shakespeare's is uh, King Lear, which, you know, the fool is a main character in. Wit is the king's wit. His job is 
uh, rather than a typical fool. His job is to insult people in the king's on the king's behalf, so that the king doesn't have to debase himself with uh, common insults and things like this. Uh, it's this this fun reverse on the the normal court jester. Uh, so Wit is uh, is rather distinguished for a jester character, uh, one might say. And at the end of every book, I give him a little epilogue, a little monologue, where he uh, kind of talks about narrative. This one I have heard before because uh, this is this is Michael Kramer, who I just adore, right? Hearing Michael Kramer do my characters just always makes me shiver. Part of my heritage as a fantasy writer is spending time listening to the Wheel of Time books on CD. Michael Kramer is like the voice of the Wheel of Time to me. And so, um, and his wife, Kate Redding, uh, these two were just very, very influential in how I view audiobooks. Blue lines suddenly appeared before her. One end of each pointing at her chest, the other disappearing into the mists. Vin immediately jumped to the side, dodging as a pair of coins shot past in the night air, leaving trails in the mist. She flared pewter, landing on the cobbled street beside the wall. Her tin-enhanced ears picked out a scraping sound. Then a dark form shot into the sky, a few blue lines pointing to his coin pouch. Vin dropped a coin and threw herself into the air after her opponent. They soared for a moment, flying over the grounds of some unsuspecting nobleman. Vin's opponent suddenly changed course in the air, jerking toward the mansion itself. Vin followed, letting go of the coin below her, instead burning iron and pulling on one of the mansion's window latches. Her opponent hit first, and she heard a thud as he ran into the side of the building. He was off a second later. Okay, so, um, midway through Final Empire... Um, Michael Kramer coming back to, uh, to give us some, uh, some more audio here. Um, so you may listen to the sequence and be like, wow, it's a, it's a complicated magic system. Um, maybe not. Maybe you'd be like, oh, that's par for the course. I, I play Final Fantasy games. This is not complex at all. Um, but regardless, um, I... When I approached the Final Empire, one of the main things that I wanted to do was make sure that the learning curve on the book wasn't too steep. So we have an opening sequence in that book where I don't show the magic at all. Um, we actually cut right before it gets used and then jump back to the character showing the aftermath, showing what the, someone with Allomancy can accomplish. Um, and I try to ease you in. Um, and this scene happening midway through the book, its goal is to kind of show you how far Vin has come, but also to show you as a reader, hey, look how far you've come. This all makes sense to you. Theoretically, if you've been reading the book, I've eased you into each of these things, and now you can see how they all work together so that you're like, oh, I get it. It's actually not that complicated. It all kind of snaps together to create all of these abilities working in tandem uh, to make people able to do what you didn't get to see in the opening, you just saw the aftermath of. Um, and that's something that I really was conscious of in writing this book. Anytime you can take the reader on the same journey as the characters, as a writer, that's like gold. If you can be like, if you can get them to feel just the same beats. It wasn't supposed to have gone like this. It's useless, one of the lads cried. He's going to kill us all, Migs. Why are you just standing there? Meg shouted at the lawman. Be at it already. He fired twice more. What's wrong with you? Maybe he's distracting us, one of the lads said, so his pal can sneak up behind us. Hey, that's... Miggs hesitated, looking toward the one who had spoken. Round face, simple round coachman's hat, like a bowler, but flatter on top. Who was that man again? He counted his crew. Nine? The lad next to Miggs smiled, tipped his hat, then decked him in the face. This is from, yes, book six of Mistborn. Um, so, slight spoilers, not actually too bad, um, because um, Mistborn is being told in multiple eras. This is one of the weird things that I'm doing uh, as a writer. I pitched this to my editor years and years and years ago. Man, it was like 2004 when I, when I pitched this. Uh, to my editor at Tor, I said, 
I want to do something pretty weird. I want to tell an epic fantasy series. And then I want to use that series to be the foundation of myth and religion in a more modern day series. Um, and Alloy of Law is kind of my, my Alloy era, the Wax and Wayne books. These four novels, um, of which the fourth one is coming out next year, um, these four novels together are a the, that second era of Mistborn. And uh, this is the opening to one of them. The big thing about these books is they are about um, a set of four characters, primarily. And two of those characters are um, uh, Wax and Wayne. Um which is is a fun pun that they don't get because they don't have a moon in the world. But you can just imagine cowboy moves to the big city, but has magic powers, um, and his sidekick changes personalities uh, whenever he puts a new hat on. Uh, then you've got the the Wax and Wayne series. It's it's a little weird, but uh, I love it. So thanks for watching the latest book, Cytonic, which you can hear a little clip from earlier. It's not too spoilery if you've read the other books. It is out now.